Hello and welcome to this episode of Follow the Project. This is episode number two. And in this episode, we're going to be looking at decks because decks can be quite fun. The last thing I want you to do is have unsafe decks or funny looking decks. So in this episode, we're gonna show you how to do it the right way. What are we doing on this project? Well, when we first turned up, this was quite an overgrown space. There was a patio area where I am now. Uh, the hedgerows, the borders, the beds had all kind of merged into one. Although this is a very generous, long garden, it didn't feel that way. I don't know if you can see at the bottom there, there is now a new patio area where there was originally a large established conifer, but this is kit form. This is what, what I mean by kit form, this is what, an active site looks like. I'm not gonna try and dress this up. There is a little bit of mess. There are materials here, but all those materials are gonna fuse together to create the different facets of this project, starting with the primary focus up here, which is the main reception space. And it is a real sun trap. And right on cue, thankfully the sun's come out because we've had nothing but rain for the last 10 days. And I wanna show you my deck because I'm quite proud of the size of my deck. Good size, good length. I had some positive comments about the length of my deck, but what are we using and how are we doing it? So this isn't a conventional timber deck. This is a composite deck. But what is composite decking? Well, composite decking is a blend of recycled wood fibers and recycled plastics, and they are molded together, incredibly tough and quite detailed as well. So boards that we're using actually have a wood grain running across one side. We're using two colors here. So we're using kind of dark kind of charcoal black, and then we're using this lighter gray here. So it's gonna give it a nice fresh contemporary feel, quite bright as well. So a nice inviting space in order to come out and enjoy and capitalize on the look down the garden, but also that sun in the morning. The fundamental part of your deck is the subframe, it's the structural integrity, it's what's gonna hold the whole deck together. So everything you put on top of that is resting on that subframe. Secondly, it's the bit that you're not gonna be able to access. So you wanna make sure you invest some time and effort to make sure that you protect the longevity of that subframe as much as possible. And you also want to make sure that when you're on your finished deck, it's not like a trampoline. I've seen so many decks where the spars are too far apart and when you walk on the boards, it's a lot of flexion and movement. So the way to avoid that is make sure that you set out everything correctly in order to withstand the rigors of constant use, in order to withstand the elements, but also to make sure that you can stand on your deck safely. So what we do, well, initially you need to set up square away from the house because that's gonna dictate all your levels. So you want to establish a wall plate by fixing a timber up against the house and you want to make sure you avoid any ingress of water. So you want to make sure you're below the damp proof. You can then start running your spars. So these are your spars and they are going to dictate the way that you lay the deck. In this case, we wanted the area to feel wider. So our decking spars come out away from the house. So that means we can lay our boards, as you can see here, laterally. So it makes this whole area feel wider. So once you've decided which way you're gonna lay your frame and lay your boards, you need to make sure that your beams are a minimum of 40 centimeter centers. So that means the center of every joist here is 40 centimeters apart. And the reason why is that's to stop any movement or suspension. So even with my weight on that, next to no movement whatsoever. And it allows you then to measure your cuts as well because you're working in 40 centimeter intervals. It creates a good structurally integral subframe, but you've only secured your boards one way to stop any flexion or movement between the joists. That's when you're gonna put your noggins in. And again, if you can do, it's worth spending a bit more time to put as many of these in as possible because that's gonna stop any bowing or movement of the subframe timber. The subframe timber itself is essential that you use something like a tantalized or treated subframe timber. In this case, we're using six by two tantalized treated timbers. Okay, now this is a redwood. So I believe actually this is Douglas fir which has its own kind of integral properties, resistant against the weather here in the UK. A lot of moisture in the winter months. We wanna make sure whatever timber we put down is gonna withstand as much of the elements as possible. And so everything we can do to make sure that we enhance the longevity of this is essential. So we wanna make sure that the water isn't holding against the subframe. So we want to make sure there is a gap underneath all the timbers here. So we don't want any of our joists sat constantly in the moisture because that's only gonna start the decay. 
The size of the timbers is completely up to you, but a minimum I would suggest, if you can get it into the space, is six by two. If you're building a deck over any areas of vegetation, critical that you remove that vegetation first. So if your deck area is going to go out across an area of lawn, or perhaps you've got an area of weeds that have built up you want to cover over, two things that you can do. One is completely remove all that vegetation, but that's not good enough because that vegetation, believe it or not, once you've removed it, you're opening that soil up, and in that soil there could be a whole myriad of different things laying dormant. So we want to make sure we suppress any future growth, and that's where you want to use something like a taram or a weed membrane to completely eclipse any scope of any sunlight getting in there. Although this deck is gonna create a darker space underneath, there are still voids where that light can get through and you'll be amazed at what can prosper underneath a deck if you leave that surface open to the sunlight. Now, in our case, we've got an elevated deck. You know, we've got a slight cantilever going over here, where we're gonna have some herbaceous planting. So we want to make sure our clients, when they've had a couple of beers, aren't gonna run the risk of ending down there. So we're going to put a handrail in here. In this case, we're gonna use some treated, kiln dried, free of hearts. And what does that mean? That means it's free of any of the heartwood, so it's less susceptible to twisting or moving. These are gonna be covered with a box section sleeve in the same color as the composite decking down below. So that'll make sure everything looks the same and it's gonna to add to that kind of clean contemporary look that we're looking for. Some swanky camera work from Paul. And you're probably bored of me rattling on about the size of my deck. So let's move on to something else. What else has been going on since our last visit? Well, remember there was a long, the Gustrum hedgerow here, so we've cut that back. We were very careful in doing so. We've now reinstated this horizontal privacy trellis here. I'm obsessed with the darker shades at the moment. And the reason being, when you see this garden finished, it makes the greens really pop. At the moment, we've got a little bit of stray chickweed growing in here at the moment, but this is going to play host to our vegetable patch. But where is it? It's on top of the old bomb shelter, which was part of the house. And I was very keen to make sure we tried to do something with this space because it was a bit of a scruffy space. So we're gonna try and fuse this space into the upper area here. In front of this newly painted wall, we can have some herbaceous planting. We've added a new door to create a more secure and weather tight environment as well, because the client is going to use that for storage. Whereas previously it was a bit of a dumping ground. We've got the shed we've brought further up. And then behind the shed, we're gonna have our utility space because every garden really does need a utility space. Any timber left over, we're going to store in our new log store. So we've built that out of some of our offcuts there. And then it's down to the garden. At the moment, remember, I make no apologies for this. This is an active site. So we've got a lot of work going on. Hence, we've got a lot of materials and the composite. We've got our big timbers here as well, which we're still going to use for some of the features at the bottom end of the garden. We're gonna really try and accentuate the client's vegetable patch here. So we put some new edging in. And eventually, I think what we're gonna to have to do is a wholesale kind of renovation of the lawn. Remember, if you need any tips on maintaining your lawn, you can always check the link out at the end of the video. Here are the beds and borders, which we need to get back into order. And we've also got a couple of fruit trees in here. We've got a couple of damsons at the bottom and apples. These will need taming. And hang around to the end of the video because we've got five things that you can be getting on with in your garden at this time of year. Now, this, it's going to become a video in its own right because this is where the original pond was and we are going to reinstate that pond and it's actually going to become, become a little bit bigger. It was much bigger than I anticipated when we emptied it all out. This will be become a real hotbed of activity during the spring and summer months. Things like frogs, damsonflies, dragonflies, all the water-loving beetles, snails, which will accumulate over the course of the summer months in this one space. And a perfect little vista from that lower tier patio over our pond area. So this is just a small seating area for the evening. So we put some big chunky six by six posts in and these are going to play host to some festoon lighting. Everyone's all about festoon lighting. Well, what's festoon lighting? It's like carnival or old funfair lighting, which you go across here. It's all about creating ambiance in the evening and that will be further accentuated by having the client's chimney down here. So any of that spare timber, they're going to burn down here, keep themselves warm as the summer months start turning a little bit colder. And then eventually the garden is going to go back to nature wholesale in this area of the garden at the moment. It just looks like a weedy, patch of soil and that's because that's what it is at the moment but we're going to populate this with pollinators we're going to have some semi-shade loving plants in here we're going to try and do what we can to suppress the ground elder which is taking over down here this is a nightmare but the only way to get on top of this and stay on top of this is constant 
extraction and removal and if you can do suppress it with something like a natural bark chipping and that's exactly what we're going to do here because we don't want to completely cover over it with a taram or a membrane because underneath that soil is some wild garlic and that smells amazing and I don't want to get rid of it because it has a lovely leaf, it has a wonderful smell as well and the client's keen to keep it and forage and use it for their cooking. So anything we can do to create a more natural environment while suppressing that ground elder, bane, bane of my life this stuff. If you can see once it gets in and gets happy it spreads in abundance. Now this is not the way to remove it sadly because you can see all I'm doing is taking the upper stem and we want to take the root system out. So by suppressing this as much as possible with new material, clean soil and then some of the organic or natural bark chippings, we can do our utmost to suppress this and then we can start taking out the root system in pockets. You can use something like a handheld bowl planter to just get over the plant, twist, turn and remove that root system. But you're going to have to be diligent and you have to stay on top of it because as I said, once that you find that one rears its head, it's going to bring over not just one or two friends, it's going to bring over a whole cluster of friends to join the garden party. So constant work in the garden. I said to you, gardener's work's never done and it really isn't. Whether you want to improve your space, whether you want to just keep maintaining your space, the more time you spend in the garden, the better it's going to look. But also I think the better you're going to feel as well because you make those tangible differences and you put your own little kind of mark on your own outdoor space. Anyway, so this is the bottom end of the garden. Looking back up, savour that complete and utter mess and also enjoy the fact that the guys are on their break. There's only one person who works around here. That's Paul, the cameraman. <laughs> That's, that's not fixed yet. Edit that out. Uh, if you've enjoyed the tour of my big deck and the rest of the garden, then don't forget you can always join us in part three where you'll be able to see the rest of the progress. And if you're looking for things to do in your garden at the start of August, here are five things you can do in your garden right now. Number one, carefully cut back your hedges. Get on top of that summer's growth. But remember, check and peek inside because we don't want to ruffle any feathers check for those last broods and make sure you go slow and carefully and trim back that flouncier foliage and just stay on top before it starts taking away the rest of your garden. Number two, enjoy the fruits of your labour. Start picking your fruit and start checking your fruit trees as well because this is the time where you'll be able to start noticing any fungal infection or worse still, any beetle or weevil infection. Act now, be proactive in the garden Proactive picking and proactive pruning will stop any further decay. More picking, pick your peas because they will be in perfect picking. Something else will begins with pea. Perfect, perfect, no, perfect picking, perfect picking position. position. <laughs> Do this again. <Yep. laughs> pick your peas because they will be in a perfect position to pick. First take, not just your peas, it could be your courgettes, it could be your corn as well. August is where we start taking in that bounty of new growth. All that hard work in the vegetable patch is where we now start to enjoy it on our plate and it's gonna taste its best at this time of year. Remember, the more you pick, the more it's going to grow. So enjoy that season, enjoy your garden's moment in the sun before the sun goes. More pruning, especially your wisteria. We don't have one on site, but if you've got a wisteria, perfect time to prune. And number five, and probably the most important this time of year, is enjoy your garden. <laughs> but on a serious note, it's time to take your foot off the gas. Enjoy all the fruits of your endeavours in the garden. Take in the last of that summer sunshine and just relax in your outdoor space because just around the corner is my favourite season and the busiest season in the gardener's diary, and that is autumn. And if you want to keep up to date with what we're doing on site, what I'm doing in my garden, and what are the best tools to help you tackle your garden at home, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, or hang around and check the link out at the end of the video.